All right, so um, our next speaker is Dr. Ginger Chu, who is a uh, senior scientific advisor for the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Uh, Chu has a very distinguished career. There's, I could read the whole paragraph, but I, I had the privilege, I think, of meeting her first when she was at Columbia. She's, uh, uh, she has a doctorate of science in environmental microbiology from Harvard. She did a postdoc in the ne Netherlands. And Dr. Chu's research focuses on exposure assessments of bioaerosols in the indoor environment. Uh, so on, on that note, Ginger, I'll turn things over to you. Thank All right. you. All right, Paula, thank you so much. I really appreciate the intro. It's nice seeing you again. Um, uh, Ginger, okay. if you could just give us one second, we're going to uh, working on the mic uh, to hear you in the room. Okay. Are you able to right. see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you today. Um, my, my topic is examples of how occupancy behavior can affect indoor air quality and how indoor air quality can change their behavior. Let's see, Let's try to get this, um, okay. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development developed a training which covers some of the most common asthma triggers found inside homes. Working on the standardized training material with these dear colleagues from EPA, HUD, and CDC colleagues was one of the highlights of my career. I'm glad to give a shout out to one of them who is a panelist in the last session, Laura Cobb. The front page of the checklist contains a glossary of terms for allergens and irritants which affect indoor air quality. Many of these are affected by occupant behavior in the home. Cooking can increase moisture and generate indoor air pollutants, including gases and particles. For people with asthma, indoor air pollutants from cooking can be irritants or worsen asthma symptoms. Moisture from cooking can accumulate and cause mold problems if wet materials, such as kitchen cabinets, are not able to dry out. This slide shows two exhaust fans, the one at the top vents to the outdoors, the one below vents back into the kitchen. If the home's exhaust hood looks like the one at the bottom, the resident or the landlord should consider replacing or fixing the range hood so it vents to the outdoors. Even people who don't have furry pets can be exposed to pet allergens in homes and elsewhere. For example, Bringing in used furniture from a home that had pets can also in introduce pet allergen into the home. Pet allergens can be carried into the home on clothes and other soft furnishings and from other locations such as daycare or a friend's home. Exposure might be greater in homes with carpet, which can hold more pet allergen than a smooth surfaced floor. Therefore, just because a pet is not living inside the home, we should not assume pet allergens are not in that home. Along with cats and dogs, other animals in the home can be sources of allergens and irritants. These include furry pets, such as hamsters, gerbils, guinea pigs, rabbits, and ferrets. Birds have allergens too, and pets, pet food can attract cockroaches, rodents, and other pests. All cages and litter boxes of pets should be cleaned regularly. Preferably the person with asthma should not be doing this cleaning. Cleaning should be done with proper ventilation while the person with asthma is away from the area. The next section, section is about pests. Several things can affect pests and their allergens. Changes by re residents in the home, such as new roommates, parties with a lot of food, or a new pet, uh, changes in the building, new holes, recent pesticide application in neighboring apartments, and seasonal changes. Cold weather can drive pests indoors. The next slide shows examples of changes inside and outside the home that can affect pests and their allergens. Leaving trash next to buildings can attract pests such as cockroaches and rodents. Subsequently, the pests can enter the building to find other sources of food and shelter. 
Leaving dirty dishes in the sink or on the table can also attract pests, and if left overnight, mold can be grow grown. Mold can begin to grow too. Just want to point out that doing these things doesn't always attract pests and rodents. Um, there, in some some neighborhoods, if you, you're building single family home, for example, if your building does not already have a current cockroach problem, you could probably leave your dishes out. So one of the problems that we see is when people are moving from different types of homes, they grew up in a single family home, but now they live in a multifamily apartment building. And the way you used to live in your home when you were a single family out in the suburbs, you could leave your dishes out for a little bit. But now that you've moved into the city, sharing walls and pipes and conduit with other uh, apartments in the building, you really should be cognizant that you might have some pest infestation because of those other problems, uh, th those other sources, even if you just have your dishes out for a few hours overnight after a dinner party. Various methods are available to control pests. Gel bait application for insects, such as cockroaches, and snap traps are used for mice and rats. However, spray pesticides, bombs, and foggers are also asthma triggers. The pesticides themselves lead to chemical exposures to children and pets. Dust mites are microscopic. They burrow into textile furniture and bedding and cannot be easily seen. It's difficult to get rid of dust mites in homes because they burrow into the upholstered furniture, mattresses, and bedding. Dust mites thrive in humid conditions. Dehumidifiers can decrease the humidity and make it difficult for dust mites to survive but residents should be careful not to dry out the air too much because it can also dry out a person's mucous membranes. This, this slide shows an a infrared photo of a uh, temperature of different surfaces in the home. The box shows temperature differences around a windowsill. The red and yellow areas are hotter next to the co cooler blue area below the windowsill. Large differences in temperature on surfaces can lead to condensation. Mold is found virtually in every environment. It can be detected indoors and outdoors year round. Mold growth is encouraged by warm and humid conditions. Outdoors, mold can be found in damp areas or places where leaves or other vegetation are decomposing. Indoors, mold can be found where humidity levels are high, such as showers. Common sources or causes of mold, um, of water and moisture damage include roof leaks, leaks from plumbing, window air conditioners, and other appliances. Condensation associated with high humidity or cold spots in the building. Localized flooding, uncontrolled humidity. This is a photo of mold growing on a ceiling tile. This is mold growth that occurred after a plumbing leak. Many things can change the conditions that give rise to mold. When residents change their furnishings, such as pillows, carpet, mattresses, or furniture, the mold exposure can change too. Donated and even new materials can have mold depending upon where the materials have been stored. Home visitors might consider this when they see new or different furnishings in the home. In some regions of the country, people live in their homes differently according to the season. For example, in hot summer months, the air conditioning might be used a lot and windows and doors are closed. Any asthma triggers in the home can get sealed indoors. Likewise, in the cold winter months, the home can get sealed and the asthma triggers in the home are also sealed. In fall, raking and walking around outside can bring mold inside from leaves. Pets can also change the mold levels in home. They might bring in mold from the outside, then jump onto furniture and beds. This increases the concentration of mold spores in the home, although it might not necessarily lead to mold growth on a surface. Volatile organic compounds, VOCs, are emitted as gases from certain solids or liquids. VOCs include a variety of chemicals, some of which have short-term or long-term adverse health effects and can irritate airways of persons with asthma. Concentrations of many VOCs can be higher indoors than outdoors. The next section is how indoor air quality can change occupant behavior. 
The use of humidifiers means that the air is dry and people are trying to make it more comfortable. However, if the humidifier is located near a wall or close to the ceiling, moisture can build up on surfaces and lead to mold growth. Humidifiers should be cleaned frequently to make sure that the mold is not growing inside the appliance itself. When residents try to reduce mold growth, they might try things that can lead to unintended indoor air quality issues. These are the correct steps for cleaning mold. Fix the leaky plumbing and leaks in the building envelope as soon as possible. Watch for condensation and wet spots and fix sources of moisture problems as soon as, they, as, soon as possible. Keep HVAC drip pans clean, flowing properly, and unobstructed. Vent moisture generating appliances, such as dryers, to the outside. Use exhaust fans when showering and cooking. Maintain low indoor humid humidity below 50%, ideally 30 to 50% if possible. Residents can use an inexpensive device called a hygrometer to measure relative humidity in the home. Perform regular building and HVAC inspections and maintenance as scheduled. Clean and dry wet or damp spots within 48 hours. Replace absorbent materials such as ceiling tiles and carpet if moldy. However, here is what can happen when occupants try to clean up mold. They add cleaning products. Sometimes they mix ammonia and bleach. From previous workshop presentations on indoor chemistry, we know that secondary chemical reactions can occur. Chlorine itself is reactive with VOCs. Hydrogen peroxide is reactive too. It can oxidize other chemicals in the air or on surfaces. One of the most familiar examples of when indoor air quality leads occupants to react is when they cook something that creates smoke on a stove. This work by Lawrence Berkeley Labs shows how cooking behavior changes. So I'll go across uh, they tested houses and they tested apartments. And on the left column, uh, it's dichotomized into if it's the highest five minute particulate matter greater than 50 micrograms per cubic meter. And you can see, um, even when the researchers measured high levels of PM2.5, there was not a statistically significant change in the use of overhead exhaust fans. For apartment dwellers in smaller homes, there was a tendency to use the exhaust fan more, but it didn't reach statistical significance. Here are what I think are the next steps for changing occupant behavior to decrease indoor air quality issues. Smart buildings, health communications, especially tailored health communications, educations of students in kindergarten through high school, and giving indoor air quality results back to occupants. Smart buildings with low cost sensors can help show occupants their levels in real time. I have a quote from a recent paper that was co-authored by one of today's speakers, Bill Bonfleth. The quote says, low cost sensors are a viable technology. PM 2.5 demonstrated stability, durability, and robustness. During Hurricane Katrina response, I observed this myself with students from a university who were measuring different sizes of particle, particles in homes. There was a real-time sensor that had different size bins of particles. During the demolition of the interior walls of the home, the levels were so high that I observed the student researchers making, their, making sure their respirators and goggles were fitting properly. The same principle can apply to residents during normal times the automatic kitchen hood that turns on whole cooking, during cooking. Um, hearing Vito's talk earlier about his teenage daughter painting her nails, that's when the exhaust fan could kick in too, right? This fact sheet was developed during COVID response by CDC, EPA, and HUD. Frequent use of foggers, misters, and electrostatic sprayers was commonplace in the early days of the pandemic. There was the concept of hygiene theater, the optics that someone is cleaning something so it will be safe. If anyone has cleaned their bathroom with cleaning products right before they have a guest, such as a mother-in-law, visit their home, they know that hygiene theater can be used to help reinforce 
that the home is clean to their relative. What they don't realize is that it might trigger symptoms of asthma for that visitor. CDC and NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, worked on this particle calculator, calculator to let residents know how different ventilation modifications could affect the concentration of particles in their home. The models are based on particles, so other indoor air quality issues could also be controlled with these ventilation strategies, not just viruses. During hurricane season in 2017, I worked on this booklet for children to understand what they likely saw after hurricanes Maria, Harvey, and Irma hit with just a, within just a few weeks of each other. Deployed to Texas after Hurricane Harvey, there was a need for materials for children. At the Disaster Recovery Center, we only had materials for adults. As children experience major, major natural disasters, there is an immediate need to explain indoor air quality. This could be extended to more typical times, and EPA has undertaken this effort. Their link has many resources for all ages of students. For one of my studies, I gave a pre presentation to a town hall of residents who participated in my research study. I had to explain parts per million. So I took a tube that has absorbent material that can measure isopropanol. I sprayed some window cleaner into a plastic bag, and I used the tube to draw air from the bag into the colorimetric tube. This demonstration helped residents understand the parts per million values, PPM, that we gave to them and it, uh, when it showed how it, their concentrations were relative to the air in the plastic bag. And finally, there are many other researchers who have written extensively on giving back study results to participants. This quote from Katrina Korfmacher and Julie Brody struck me as hopeful for the future. Experience shows that when personal results are returned with appropriate contextual information, report back can increase environmental health literacy and promote individual actions. I want to thank everyone for um, the opportunity to present today, and I look forward to the Q&A and panel discussions. Thank you, Ginger. That was a really um, interesting talk and understanding all of the things that people can do or should do or shouldn't do um, to uh, things that will impact their indoor air quality. So. Um, I think we get, I get to ask you one question. So, um, and again, we talked a lot about messaging this morning, but I thought I would ask you that is, um, how can um, actionable public health messaging on indoor chemistry change human base? So, so it's supposed to general indoor air quality, the specifics of um, how, how do we get things to people to take action? You talked about this a little bit in your talk. Right. Um, it, we, we need to, to and, and other speakers have mentioned this, we need to speak to the, the, the audience in the context of what they can and cannot control. And if they can't control things, we have to go downline, downstream or upstream, um, to make those controls. And for the example of, uh, Vino's, Vito's teenage daughter, you know, he's having a hard time telling her, open the windows when you're painting your nails. Like if automatically the 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 exhaust fan comes on when that happens, when it detects uh, high levels of VOCs, you know, that's taking some of the the blame from Vito. <laughs> and um, it's it will be just a given. And then people in the future will n notice like, Oh, when I, well, it already happens. When I stir fry something on my stove and it's really smoky, my smoke detector goes off. So we have become acclimated to those changes. People already know if you're around children and you see someone smoking, there's stigma for that. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're smoking in front of children. 
which is a lot different from the 1950s, right? So it's going to happen. And I, I think the ways that we reach out, um, I, I really do applaud EPA's efforts for doing early education for environmental health literacy. I think that once we make it more normal for children, uh, you know, throughout the age range to, to say, oh, this is not right. You know, these exposures are not right. Um, I, I think that we'll, we'll get somewhere and having some automated um, smart buildings as well. Observation that, that taking, if we have the, if the building can protect us or turn things on and off, just as people have smart thermostats to make the temperature go up or down, it would be good for this to happen in indoor air quality. And people wouldn't have to think, what does that mean? Or as when the smoke alarm goes off, when you're doing the stir fry, it's, that does send everybody into a, uh, into action. Um, all right. So we're going to, there, we're going to go into the panel discussion soon, but is there, a, are there any questions that people have um, for Ginger right now, or should we assemble the panel? I, all right. So we're going to assemble the panel. All right. And so Linda, am I supposed to say up here or go over there? Oh, we're going to sit. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just want to make a comment about it's so good to meet in person. Uh, my colleague to my left and I have been working together for almost four years and we had never met. <laughs> so except over Zoom calls and it's different to meet in person. So again, I, I thank the academies for bringing us together so that uh, again, we can get things done. All right, so we have... Um, four panelists or five panelists um, and are all of our virtual panelists here yet or not yet? We are bringing Brian online. Uh, because there's also um, Don Weeks, yes. Are they they're on. <laughs> they're on. All right, so okay, there we go. Um, all right, so we have we have all of our <laughs> oh Linda's computer explains everybody. All right, so anyway, so let's um, first get started by um, I'd like each of the panelists to to um, introduce themselves um, and say how happy they are here. So I'll start with my <laughs> colleague Joel Solomon. I. Literally, I've been working with him for four years. So glad to meet him in person. Anyway, but Joel. Well, let me start by saying how happy I am to be here today. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Joel Solomon. I lead the National Education Association's Health and Safety Program. NEA, the National Education Association, is the largest union in the country. We have three million members, affiliates in every state, but also 14,000 local associations. It's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, Jonathan Petrie. I'm an architect with the uh, Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment. And uh, in that office, I focus primarily on uh, uh, decarbonizing the built environment, but also uh, human health effects, uh, improving uh, outcomes for our occupants, helping folks uh, increase their resilience and the, the readiness of the force. All right, then next I'll go to uh, Brian uh, Bisson. Am I saying your name wrong, Brian? That, Sorry. That, yes, that is correct. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Bisson. I currently work for American Federation of Teachers uh, in the Health Issues Department. Uh, so we uh, serve our members uh, with all things, I just say all things health and safety. Uh, prior to working for AFT, I worked as a uh, full-time carpentry instructor with the Connecticut Technical High School System. And uh, I'm sure it will come up in the, in the panel uh, questions, but uh, we have been preparing uh, teenage you know, students and uh, CTE students um, to work in the, the building industry 
and to fully understand the importance of indoor air quality and how um, the systems work uh, or how homes as well as um, uh, uh, commercial buildings work as a system uh, so that they have that deeper understanding of, of how important it is to ensure that uh, buildings are maintained as well as built so that the indoor air quality is uh, beneficial for all occupants. And I'm ha happy to join you today. Thank you for the invite. All right, and then um, Don Weeks. Don? Hello. Uh, I'm also happy to be here, but I'm happy to be anywhere at this point in my life. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, <laughs> Basically, I, I'm uh, an industrial hygienist, a certified industrial hygienist. Uh, I've been doing my my field work since 1975, so that makes it 49 years. Um, I was invited here today as a representative of the um, ACGIH, which is the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, and, I'll, and I hope to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about their uh, main function, which is to do threshold limit values for various chemicals, things of that nature, including by aerosols. So uh, I hope to be able to talk about that and to uh, respond to questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. So I'm, I am I have some questions here and later we'll get to the audience questions, but I'm going to start with Joel. And um, we know that an a number of school systems, particularly in Boston, have install, installed um, CO2 meters and make the data available. So how, and I'm not asking you about Boston, I'm just asking in general, um, how can we use real-time access to data to drive action? Thank you. Um, you know, data can be crucial in decision making, in planning, in action. Data for data's sake can be difficult to use, could be misleading. So what we see, and it's uh, a lot of states and, and localities are doing this, where it's effective, data can be reviewed from the past because uh, you need a time to look at it consider it, but also there needs to be ways for people reviewing data to report concerns, to have follow-up, to know that where there are concerns, the appropriate folks are looking into it. Data on its own can sometimes, we've seen, be used to say, look, we're collecting data, but if there's no actionable connected way that parents can see it, students, educators of all types, then it actually can lead folks to say, well, we're dealing with it by collecting data. Uh, the data in and of itself doesn't help. When it's connected to actions and follow-up, it can. Sounds good. So that sounds, makes sense to me. All right. Um, does anyone, any of the other panelists want to uh, talk about how, about access to real-time data? Sure. I'll give you, I, I was fortunate. I was, thank you. I was fortunate to attend the Green Schools Conference a couple months ago. I'll give you a couple of quick stories uh, from uh, the, the conference. Uh, so the uh, Car Clark County School District, which serves Las Vegas, um, they uh, installed IAQ monitors. And the two quick stories is one, uh, so they, they are monitoring real time. And in one of the classrooms, they noticed that the VOC level was severely increased. And that led to some, you know, to the point where they took immediate action. And what they ended up finding is that the uh, teacher was using a disinfectant multiple times throughout the course of the day. And that was driving that level up high. So the, the action was some education as to under, understandably, of course, you want at the time you're, and, and continue, we want to disinfect, but understanding that might not be the proper disinfectant to use and what can we use that does not elevate VOCs. So an uh, issue resolved uh, just by having that monitoring equipment. The, uh, the second quick story is really about a uh, buy-in from the district who is also ultimately paying for those uh, monitoring uh, uh, monitoring devices. And that is um, 
there was uh, one of the schools had a broken thermostat that wasn't detected until they installed the monitors. R replacing that one monitor saved $500 in energy cost in one month. So multiply that out by the number of sites that exist and these low, you know, say low hanging fruit that can be repaired or replaced. And now there's buy in from, of course, the district as well as the teachers are understanding the importance of the um, of monitoring air, the air quality. Thank you, um, Don. Yes. Um, so the question was, are giving results from air sampling uh, instantaneously or rapidly? Is that something that we should be doing? Um, and is it a help? to do it. And certainly it's without a doubt at, if in emergency situations and situations that involve um, uh, people's uh, well-being and health, it's very important to get that data out as soon as possible. But it must be interpreted in some way. It can't just be a data dump. Um, you have to look at it and say, what's the difference between this particular set of samples versus another set of samples, perhaps in another location in the building? And the example that Brian gave is a good example of that. That stood out as being something completely different than what was happening in the other classrooms. However, you have to be aware that there, that a lot of these monitors are not necessarily very accurate, uh, plus and minus 50% in some cases. So the information that you get, you have to have some kind of interpretation of it, some kind of evaluation of it. And that does take sometimes less than instantaneously done. You may take a day or two to get that information and have it in front of somebody who can interpret that data and make some decision. And of course, that one of those people would be an industrial hygienist, which is you know what I've been doing for the last 49 years. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize that these are, are devices that, that work successfully to help with emergency situations. But if you're looking at long-term problems, you may want to do something that has a little bit more accuracy to it and, and can pinpoint the problems that you have uh, within a particular part of the building. So, Don, would you recommend, like, you, you are in favor of continuous monitoring, but in data interpretation before sharing the data? Is that what you said? Or did I miss it? Yeah, I, I, I think it's not always the case. I mean, if you have an elevated, um, like what, what Brian was suggesting, an elevated uh, VOC level in a classroom, obviously you need to take immediate action uh, because it, 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 uh, there's something going on. In this case, it's disinfectant. Uh, but in general, a lot of times there, these are more chronic problems. Uh, you know, I, I periodically smell something. Oh, okay. What what is that? You know, why is that happening? Can I capture that? Because you're not, you may not be there when the odor is actually taking place. So you, you do have to have monitors to help supplement uh, what it is that you're doing with regards to uh, normal practice of uh, of going around and taking measurements and then having them analyzed by a laboratory to determine what's going on in a building. So both, both instantaneous has its place, as well as a more long-term type of sampling, both have their place to determine different types of problems that you might have in a building. Thank you. Uh, um, Joel? Yeah, thank you. I just wanna follow up. There are the status of so many school buildings in this country uh really uh, troubling a lot of great buildings but also you know we wouldn't want to see use of technology in lieu of fixing problems that we know need to be fixed or to say well we have a monitor so we're not going to fix the windows we'll fix a window in a classroom so we also want to make sure that infrastructure is appropriately tended to funded, and of course, that funding is distributed fairly without racial bias, which we do see in this country with respect to uh, distribution of resources. So can be very important, but also not in lieu of fixing what we know needs to be fixed. All right, and Jonathan, do you wanna comment on this? We have lots more questions, and I'm sure there are lots of questions in the chat. Um, you can pass, you and Ginger both can pass if you want or answer, talk about sensors. Pass on this, Ginger, do you want to say anything more? It was just Talk one thing that, that someone had mentioned about um, the disinfectant use and the, the, the Brian mentioned about disinfectant use. And it made me think about that teacher must have felt awful once the teacher knew that they were the cause of that spike. But if the building system 
kicks in, it also takes away that blame and stigma. I'm like, oh, just the building system detected it. No blame. This is just the facts. So I, I wanted to be careful with my whole presentation not to place blame on the residents or the occupants, but this is one more step of having real-time data, feedback, and smart buildings that can help take away some of that stigma and make make it so you don't have to have really difficult conversations with the teacher. Like, why did you do this? Um, giving attitude to the teacher. Like, you don't need that. You're like, no, if you keep on using that, the sensor will keep on going. And it's like buzzing in the principal's office and we can't stand it. <laughs> Indoor air quality is a difficult topic because unless people are hot or cold, or something smells, they don't they don't notice it. And you know, our noses don't detect um, PM two point five, or I don't think they detect ozone. It's two pollutants. Um, but I, you know, I think these are you know the panel has raised lots of good points about the pros and cons, or, or how to best use real time data. All right, so um, Jonathan, um, how are IAQ decisions made? in some setting of yours. Uh, I, I'm not gonna pick a setting. You have you have hundreds of thousands of settings. Yeah, so I think that's the point. We have, we have every target setting. Any building you can think of, we probably have one. We probably have uh, more than one in multiple climate zones and multiple biomes and uh, multiple levels of urbanization or of developed versus undeveloped world. We have, uh, about 588,000 buildings, of which about 200,000 are single family homes. And so um, IAQ decisions are made uh, differently in different situations. So if we are in conflict or if we are deployed somewhere in the world, uh, people are making real time air quality measurements to know if they have to don protective gear, if they have to uh, um, combat something that's being weaponized against them. Um, we, we have that same level of readiness when we come back to mission critical facilities, but we're, we're not tracking cleaning chemicals, we're tracking uh, weaponized chemicals. Could we deploy that same type of thing through sensors and through other things? I didn't wanna answer the last question because I knew it would come up here. Um, that's a lot of data. Um, some buildings, uh, some folks have building managers that can look at air quality in every single room. We sometimes have one or two building managers for a set of 3,000 buildings in a, a, at an installation level. And so that's a lot of alarm sensors going off constantly. And either people become dull to that and can turn them all off, and it's probably worse because you think you're being uh, measured and you're not anymore, or you can uh, uh, scramble and try to solve every one of those problems and it takes you away from some of the, the bigger issues on the installation that we have. So. Um, Decisions, I think when folks are armed with information at the single family home level, they, they can address it themselves at one level. At the barracks, there's a level of uh, invasion of privacy versus monitoring versus are things, you know, is general housekeeping happening because we're not hotels in our barracks. We don't have uh, cleaning crews, soldiers and sailors and airmen and guardians all have to take care of themselves. And so, um, then we get into more commercialized office facilities, and sometimes there's base maintenance contracts and folks that take care of those, keep those clean, change filters. But um, many of our buildings have many filters that require changing uh, very frequently. And so there's a, there's a cost to that, and there's an ability to just get that done in a timely fashion. Um, and then our very industrialized environments, I think a lot more OSHA regulations, a lot more petroleum, oil, and lubricants, and, and chemical interactions in those spaces that we uh, probably monitor more real time, more about a safety issue than a general health issue. So um, real time data would be tough for us to manage. Um, we have a hard time, I think sometimes acting on just annualized data. Um, there's a lot of backlog in our facilities. Uh, there's a lot of attention to that. And uh, that's why Department of Defense is here is because we are interested in improving the health and the welfare of all of our soldiers, civilians, and their families on our installations. All right. Well, I want to turn the question around then and say, let's assume that most buildings do not have sensors to measure indoor air quality. What steps um, 
how do you help guide people to make those decisions? Does anyone want to start on that one? Otherwise, I was going to look at you, Don. Thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> well, I, I I will say that I have a little bit of experience in doing this, um, yes. simply because uh, <laughs> you know we we end up in the buildings where people are complaining, not where it's excellent air quality. I mean, nobody goes around uh, basically complaining about excellent air quality, and 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 so you, you're always there on a complaint or a, a situation that is. Uh, is at least in the minds of the people who are living there is is very discomforting to say the least and if it, it's again if it's an odor or if it's something that uh they're starting to get reactions uh, asthma attacks things of that nature so you have to have something called risk communication as part of what you're doing and that's really important when you're talking about what you what you might have in terms of say for example a town hall where you bring the people from a building into into a, a space and you talk about what it is that's, that you found as 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 uh, as results uh, that gives them some context as to what it is that is being done for that particular building i did a lot of that with schools and schools are very sensitive because there's there's really three uh, different uh, components to it you have the individuals who are attending the school, that's the students, you have the teachers and the maintenance and the people who are basically managing the school, the superintendents or the principals. Then you have the staff that's actually cleaning the building. Uh, and, and so you have a whole bunch of different individuals who have different viewpoints and what's, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And so you, you wanna be able to communicate successfully to all three groups so they, they feel like they're, they're, their concerns have been addressed in some ways. Uh, and I think that's really a critical part of this whole operation is making sure that you can communicate successfully what's the level of risk that you're dealing with in terms of that particular building, as opposed to another building or, or you know, walking across the, the uh, street, you know, and getting hit by a car. What's the risk communication you have to get across in terms of the buildings and how they're maintained and how you might have to address some of these, uh, these problems? Thank you. Does it I have a follow-up on what Don was just saying. Something that we have even in the CDC buildings are signs in our restrooms that say, you know, be careful of using products, uh, fragrances and such that might affect the most sensitive colleagues. So um, Don had mentioned you focusing on the three groups. We, we find that there's some benefit in saying we're we're trying to protect the most sensitive groups here. So um, I was talking to Laura Cobb uh, about this earlier when we were preparing for the meeting for this this day. And, you know, she mentioned children are, you, you can always go well with children if you're trying to protect children. And I, I agree with that, that there, people will do things above and beyond their own health to protect children. So that's just one angle to approach. Over. Joel. Thank you. And thank you, Don, for that answer. I, I agree. And I, I want to dig a little deeper into some of those areas you mentioned and how they function in schools. Uh, I would, would also add parents to that group. Um, yeah. Roughly speaking, about two thirds of the schools and the educators and the students in this country are working in areas where there is collective bargaining. So there are structured legal approaches to addressing indoor air quality and other potential hazards, health and safety committees, labor management committees. So there can be those structures that exist that engage the relevant parties or decision making for identifying concerns and solutions, even where collective bargaining doesn't take place, labor management committees and engagement can be a very effective way. Uh, we do trainings with members on building walkthroughs, what to look for, and encourage people to do that with school administration, because everyone has the similar interest in, in resolving the problems. And, and as Don said, bringing people together to understand the concerns, what they mean, and to find solutions, really important. Thank you. Does anyone else want to make any comments on this? Okay, Brian. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go along with Joel. And uh, just again, a personal experience when I worked for the Connecticut Technical High School System. 
uh, as a union uh, leader, we would tour uh, one school every month uh, as a as a thoroughly assess the site as far as all the the trades and technologies as well as the science labs. Uh, send out questionnaires ahead of time so that, of course, when you're there, uh, the teachers are not uh, who who are you and why are you not that they didn't know who we were, but why are you here today? Um, have a part, a role to play. Uh, and also feel free to, it's a labor management um, uh, agreement that is in that is in a contract so that both sides are coming together to, of course, improve any situation that needs to be improved. The other thing I'll mention to go along with education, and thank you, I appreciate your comment, Ginger. Absolutely, we do not want to call out educators if they do not possess the a training, right? They don't have that training to understand that the products that they're using will lead to unhealthy uh, air. And and so what we find is that there is a, uh, not to any fault of their own, but there's a lack of education and training. Um, if that person had had training as, you know, um, hazard communication training and understanding uh, of, of, you know, using certain chemicals and what can happen, then I know that person wouldn't have, made, we're not calling out that teacher, just wouldn't have made that decision, right? Would be educated not to. So part part of our mission currently, and has been for a while, is to offer uh, OSHA 10 and 30 hour classes for members. We'll work with locals. Uh, we're always working, it's union way to build capacity, offer the 10 and 30 hour classes for members, uh, ensure that they're on health and safety committees, and then the next step to build capacity is then we work with certain uh, members to become uh, authorized trainers so they can offer that education for their peers. We're a, a group of five at AFT in health and safety, and we've got a, quite a few, you know, a million, seven members. Uh, so it's difficult, of course, to get out to everyone. So it's, I'll, I'll su summarize by just saying it, it is going out and offering that education that is so desperately needed in order to understand um, what you, you know, re your responsibility is, as well as uh, things to avoid, especially in our buildings that will affect indoor air quality. Thank you. And while we're talking about education, Brian, would you mind telling us a little bit about um, the, the, um, the, the teaching of um, the, the students in the high schools who are learning about indoor air quality and HVAC? Uh, sure. So um, one of the... Um, it's just company, but we're using Building Performance Institutes. It's nationally recognized. Uh, the students are completing a, a, a their uh, a class called Building Science Principles, and that's a class that's good for anyone that owns a home. Uh, it is just uh, eye opening as to again how the, the the premise is how does your house work as a system, right? And understanding the effects of of uh, you can. You can buy the best uh, uh, oiler or uh, uh, you know a heating appliance, uh, but if you don't have uh, proper insulation or your windows leak, uh, then of course you're you're not reaping the benefits. But to go along with indoor air quality, one of the sections that's in that course uh, directly uh, is on um, humidity, uh, excess moisture and how that affects, of course, in this case, uh, we're talking about residential homes, how does that affect the home um, and everything that happens once you have excessive moisture in the house? So the students are, uh, that is part of their, their class load. Uh, that's just the uh, start of their education and they move from there. And, and it ties into weatherization, of course, started in the 70s, uh, uh, thanks, thanks in part to the oil shocks, right? We're, we want to become more energy efficient. Um, and so part of the education is to understand that, yes, we want to, we're currently building homes and, and commercial buildings to be as airtight as possible. But on the flip side, we have to understand that uh, we also need air changes in those buildings or else the occupants will become sick. So that education that I won't go, up, go on for a long time. That education is now being offered to 14 through 18 year olds that are going to go directly into the world of work, right? We, we, we have this amazing infrastructure bill. And to go along with that, we, of course, need those who are going to perform this work. And it's, and it's, it's, it's amazing to see that the, these young people that are going to get directly into that world have that education so they understand how to uh, 
um, how to build or, you know, uh, or uh, not just build, but also uh, remodel and keeping that in mind that it's, uh, it, you always want to keep the occupants, um, it, the indoor air quality for the occupants in mind as you, as you do this work. Thank you. I hope the students um, learn all the material and retain it because it will be, will help us all in the future. Um, all right. Um, I think I should go over to the quest some of the questions over here. Uh, All right, I'm gonna ask you this question, Jonathan. Um, what, if anything, can you and your team do to um, um, help occupants not bring um, unneeded chemicals indoors? So for us, I think first we have to kind of rely on our organizational structure we have in place in the chain of command. And so some of that comes out through policy, comes out through direct orders, comes out through an education process. But sometimes in the military, we don't focus on the why, we just tell people the what. So a lot of our criteria is around the what. So um, restricting uh, things usually ends up with a sign on the outside of the building, like no smoking within 50 feet of any of our buildings. And so um, but that comes from a DOD issuance that says uh, our force is going to be healthier and more ready to do its mission if we don't smoke. And so it flows down, though, top down, um, although there is many, I mean, we're very large, what, 3 million people work for DOD. A lot of things happen um, organically, happen things at, at low levels because of a, an incident or an opportunity that happens in installation. And so gathering those lessons learned, sharing those lessons learned, telling different installations what worked in one campus or what worked on one site is a key for us because we should be able to leverage kind of the diversity of thought that comes from all of our people. All right, thank you. Joel, do you want to say anything about that for the school's perspective? Well, I, I think, well, first I'll point out we have many thousands of <laughs> members who do work for the DOD as well and in um, schools, uh, on military bases. Um, and so there, as well as here, um, uh, education is really important, but that labor management engagement, identifying problems, using that as an opportunity to engage. Early in COVID, I'm sure we all went through this in one way or another. We did so much work with schools that were issuing directives on cleaning, using cleaning products in schools, and if you remember, cafeterias were closed, students were eating on the desks that were being cleaned with product. It just, you know, it was a nightmare, but engaging, educating, identifying problems, uh, and using that as an opportunity to build relationships uh, that can lead to other positive benefits. Um, it is not often top down where those relationships exist or can be built really important that way to get better information about how to handle things uh, we do represent hvac experts custodians and others in school so we also have an opportunity to educate members about uh, approaches so labor management but also education and and exactly the kind of courses that Brian mentioned also are uh, really important. All right, thank you. Does, do any other panelists want to comment on this? If not, we can move on. Uh, and also, if anyone in the room has a question, please step up to the microphones. All right, so um, there's a question for Brian. Um, question, whoever sent in the question likes the idea that you're teaching the students about buildings and and so on. Um, do you ask the students to benchmark and improve health, the health environment of their homes, you know, improving ventilation, mold, and so on? Is, or is that beyond the scope of the course? No, no. That's. I mean, I, I, I was 
part of the team that was uh, offering these classes, right? Not just someone. So uh, while having conversations with uh, teenagers is uh, really how can, because uh, I, I was mentioned, I, I was listened to the tail end of Ginger's uh, presentation. If, if you, our minds just shut down if we go, uh, we got we have a something that's affecting the planet all right well you know, we just kind of shut down but if, if the point is that we speak to something that they can do themselves and their change collective so we'll just take the change they can create and then how does that affect you know if everyone makes that change how does that move how does that help us as a whole and so that was always how we went about this is what you can do for your your you know the house i understand of course their parents own the house but this is what you can do share this with your parents share this with your relatives what can you do in your own house this is and you know we'd always ask what's happening in your house and so they they'd highlight it let's say that they don't have something as simple as uh ventilation uh you know a local ventilation in a bathroom and why is there mold growing on on the ceiling and then just to understand that it's a relatively simple fix uh, for that situation but absolutely, part of it is to to talk about not just about what you would do in the world of work, but what you do in your personal life is, and again, sharing that with friends and family as well. Thank you, uh, Don or Jin Don. Yeah, I'm going to follow up on what Brian was saying. Uh, there's a concept called uh, total worker health, which talks about not just what you exposed to at work, but also what you're exposed to in, at home also exposed in, in transportation or any other type of other uh, location, because a lot of people who, who drive for, for, for a living don't necessarily get the type of information they need to be able to, to you know, prevent problems from, the, from their own vehicle. So total worker health is a concept. It's been, it's been around for a while, but it's, it's certainly a good idea to consider that where you look at those problems, not just from the viewpoint of what he was exposed to at work, he or she was exposed to at work, but what do they do at home? What kind of hobbies do they have? Uh, do they, you know, do they, uh, do they do uh, projects that may involve paint or, or anything that may be restoring a building or something of that nature? That all adds to their total work, worker health. And so it's important to keep that in mind as another way of not just focusing in on, on the, what they're exposed to at the office or at the workplace, but also what they do in their entire lives. Can I add that, you know, uh, along with that, uh, so at, when, we, when we're done teaching uh, a, a hazard communication uh, presentation, uh, there are many that go home and check out what's happening under their, in, in their vanity or under their sink at home, right? So, uh, which is a good thing, right? If you have chemicals and again, it's, I won't go too far into it, but that's a good, that's a positive thing to check and, and then of course, properly dispose of. Uh, but to kind of tie into uh, what Don just said, it also building some healthy habits. So it's not just something I do at work. It's this is how I live and make. And so it's um, just just part of your nature as opposed to, oh, I'm at work. I have to do this. It's something that you're doing throughout and, and you know, just to add to the quality of life. Right. Thank you. Ginger, do you want to say anything on this? Or, uh, we have we have plenty of questions on the sheet and no, the chat. Nothing else to add. No, the comments from Don and Brian were great. All right, now I'm going to interject a question because this is a, a common indoor air problem. Talk to someone and says, oh, it really stinks. So this is what I did. And what the, my um, explanation as a chemist is what they did is they sprayed chemicals to mask the odor. So what are some other good, uh, does anybody have any, uh, we wanna incentivize changes in human behavior. So one of the, if something smells bad, so if their, their air smells bad, they say my indoor air quality is bad. What can, what are some positive steps to do rather than masking the odor? Now, of course people say source control, but what does that yeah. mean? Don, well, please. Uh, first, I'm, I'm not going to mention any names of products, but we all know which products we're talking about, the ones that advertise the masking of odors. Uh, it, it, it's important to recognize, you're right, it, it goes to source, but it also goes to, you know, what you're doing in the way of, of, uh, of uh, preventing that kind of problem from, you know, entering into the workspace uh, or working or into the house 
in that regard. And it, it, so you may have a source outside. Uh, people do live near re uh, factories. We heard some of that discussion this morning from some of the uh, speakers. They live near um, sources of, of odors. Uh, there's a town here uh, in Quebec, which uh, smells uh, like saltpeter all day long. Uh, how do you deal with that? You know, I mean, you, you have to think about the, the ventilation system you have for your house. Uh, and if you live near any type of source of that nature, you have to, dis to disrupt the pathway from where it is to where you are. And that may require some ventilation, may require some thicker windows, it may require uh, a number of other things. But no, the first choice should not be to mask the odor. Okay, that should be the last thing you do before you, uh, you know, before you try to work with the odor to, to eliminate it as much as possible. All right, thank you. I, all right, so we'll go to a question over here. Um, and th this question um, it is um, about just different climate environments and whether, you know, you could be in Texas, you could be in Maine, you could be in Colorado, California, and how do you take this into account when you're trying to um, improve your indoor air quality? Like what, how do we, in, in, do we need to incentivize people differently who live in different climates? I think it's helpful to let people know in different climates. I was just in a discussion earlier before this meeting uh, about regional effects and importances of the importance of focusing some of your messages um, at the regional level. So for example, we know that in humid environments, formaldehyde can off gas faster. We saw that in, um, you know, there's a, it's well established that formaldehyde can increase in humid environments. So I think when you have someone that, um, I don't know, I've seen a lot of social media advertising these whole body sprays. So we used to just focus on underarms and now, you can buy whole body sprays for everywhere. <laughs> if the if teenagers and not to just just teenagers, but I think they're a lot of the target audience. If if they're using that in Florida, where it's already humid, and you have increased formaldehyde off gassing, you're you're really creating this mixture, this this um, this awful air indoor air quality problem that generations ago didn't have this issue. So it, I, I still think just, you know, education, it's gonna be sort of slow going and we are having an uphill battle against social media, advertising a lot of these products to make you smell like a rose. Um, humans don't smell like roses. So <laughs> so um, I, I, I think it's an uphill battle and it's something that's unique and I applaud National Academies for putting out the, the report on secondary chemical reactions. And I applaud EPA for all of their work with letting the public know about these secondary chemical reactions, researchers like Delphine Farmer. They're fantastic. We just need more and more of it. And we need to target those audiences as much as social media is doing. And right now we hardly have the bandwidth to sit and write a manuscript but write the manuscripts. So any of those citizen scientists out there, work with community-based organizations, work with local universities, and try to get those papers published. I see in the chat, someone was asking about, um, you know, bringing in chemicals um, into different buildings. And I think that if we have trusted agents, which are many of our community health workers, if we give them more of a voice, more than just going to home visits and talking with families, which is great. And they are filling a niche, which many of us cannot fill. But if we can also get their names on journal manuscripts, get them out in, in the peer reviewed public, uh, peer reviewed literature, it gives them a little bit more weight to say, this is what I see when I do home visits. And I've been telling all the academic researchers what to do, but they are still focusing on you know, this other problem, but you know, this full body spray for teenagers is really an issue. So I, I think that's where we can have, uh, there was talk about that more community based participatory research, more community engagement in, in the earlier sessions. I, I think we just keep on doing it and don't give up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with respect to climate, also, the, yes, of course, it varies, but I want to complicate it a little bit 
because it's also changing. Climate events that affect indoor air quality everywhere, but in schools where we have folks working and working with students, wildfires, hurricanes, and all of the related indoor air quality concerns that come from that. But state laws are different regarding school buildings and windows and HVAC, excessive heat, uh, where there are state OSHA plans, there can be differences. Really important to understand the local and state context and the climate issues and how they're changing. We have a lot of places that had no HVAC systems for years and were fine and now are not fine without it because of changing conditions. And I also don't wanna forget that within a climate, the distribution of resources can be so different that some folks are better prepared to deal with climate issues and folks often in communities and schools serving predominantly students of color, less so. So yes, and it gets more complicated the more you dig. So what you're saying is whatever the traditional climate zones, there's some chart I saw somewhere that just with some of these extreme weather events and what it just things are a, a lot different. For example, where I grew up, there was no air conditioning. You didn't need it, but now you need it. Um, so all right, so that's um, helpful. Does anyone else want to um, make comments on this particular issue? Yeah, I'll add, you know, the different regions of the country have obviously different materials that are available to them with different levels of chemicals, uh, either more natural chemical, more natural stone products versus more artificial man-made products in different parts of the country, different regions of the world. Um, but I think climate and the, the temperature and humidity differences are what affect us the most because it really affects how we can ventilate the spaces. Uh, the outdoor air quality, the wildfires affect maybe filtration requirements we put on things, but all of that drives our energy costs up quite a bit when you have to take humidity out of the air before you can bring it in. Um, and then in some situations, just the extreme temperatures of where we have our buildings really affects our the cost effectiveness of our ventilation. And if we could always ventilate to the to the prescribed level, I think our energy bills would, would kind of match that. And so we have to come up with other solutions. We obviously like to pass the solutions better, but uh, active solutions are on the table. That's why we're looking for uh, more research, more science to help uh, guide us uh, in scalable solutions for the Defense Department. Thank you. All right, so let me, I'm gonna move back to the, this list, these questions versus these questions. And um, this is for Don. To what extent is the population informed on in, indoor air quality standards or guidelines? Uh, well, certainly then we're, we're um, aware of it now because of the pandemic and, and of course the wildfires last last summer, which are gonna reoccur again, folks, uh, just so you know. And, and it, it, it's funny because I, I don't think most people uh, in the United States, I live in Canada, really could pinpoint specific locations in Canada until they started worrying about the wildfires. And said, "Oh, so it's coming from there. Okay, that's what that's where the problem is." And I kind of think of uh, the song. What was it? Blame Canada. So I think there was a lot of thought about what what's going on with indoor air quality in, in that regard. And and I think that's a good thing. But it's kind of mixed, kind of in, in some ways, because people have a different viewpoint depending on what their affiliation may be. I'll put it that way. Uh, and so there's a lot of discussion about why these things are occurring. I agree with what, what Joel said. There are definitely changes in the environment going on. But really, some people deny that it's human uh, intervention that's causing that. No matter what it is, it doesn't matter. It's it's happening, and we, we have to deal with it. And I think that the people's perception of indoor quality is changing just because of what you um, well, I said before, we're, we have an in, we have changed from being a a a, a um, part of the world where you don't need air conditioning to where just about all of North America now you need air conditioning at one sort or another. That's that changes the whole uh, idea of, from natural ventilation to mechanical ventilation, and how is that going to change the way in which people 
work in and live in their in their homes and, and live, go to their schools or go to their buildings. So with the change in the climate, we're going to see more of this type of attitude about what we got to have to do to, to, to improve the indoor air quality. Because unfortunately, we still have a lot of misinformation out there that we have to com combat to make sure that we get to the right sources and get to the right information that uh, is really going to improve the environment. Thank you. Just just Brian. add to that. It, it, uh, I know part of this uh, is to talk about messaging, right, for people. And I agree with Don that whatever you can certainly have your beliefs as to what's causing it, but just to have the general understanding that it is happening. I know I just copied what you said, Don, but it is happening. So how how do we help ourselves is really where it is. And uh, and, and again, going back to the fact that uh, the, the goal for new construction as well as existing construction is to make it as energy efficient as possible, which seals up the house. That's the whole, whole light of, or commercial buildings. And to ensure that these mechanical systems are in place as well as uh, energy recovery, you know, ensure that a mechanical system also has a uh, uh, is able to capture is not so you're not sending out the air that you just heated or the air that you just cooled that you have uh, able to capture that. Uh, but it's so important to have those air changes in a house because then, of course, the it's just it's going back to everything as a system and the more education we can provide so that even the, your not even but a homeowners as well as business owners understand these concepts. It's not something that's foreign. They have at least the education they need to make the decisions that will help. Uh, with their own uh, air quality in, in the place that they work or live. Thank you. Does anyone else on the panel want to comment on that? Or Okay, that's, do you have any questions? Should I, I can go back? All right, so we talked a little bit about this, um, Brian and Joel did. The question is, how are labor unions involved in the IAQ discussion and why do they get involved? So I. So the fact that we have this question, I think we need to talk a little bit, a bit more about it. It is a fundamental question. It was before the pandemic and it is clearer to so many people now, wherever we are in the pandemic. Learning conditions for students are working conditions for educators. And by educators, I mean everyone working in schools, including bus drivers and cafeteria workers and the custodians and the teachers and the paraeducators, the whole range of folks. The health implications, I think we would all understand asthma and others, but the learning implications are clear as well indoor air quality and its connection to learning, really important. Discipline, there's so many school related issues that are connected to indoor air quality, healthcare costs. I mean, the, the range of things and through collective bargaining or labor management engagement where bargaining doesn't take place engaging parents and other partners. There's so much that can be done, but it is a fundamental education issue for all of those reasons. Thank you. Do you want to say anything, Brian, or do you think Joel? Uh, uh, absolutely agree with Joel. And I, I, I'm your storyteller. I, a few years back, we were asked to travel to uh, Detroit Public Schools. Uh, and uh, I travel with an industrial hygienist because I am not one. And we, of course, collected samples. And, and the point of being at these schools uh, was, uh, of course, to find the root cause, right? And we, we certainly found that. But um, it, it shouldn't be that difficult for labor and management to agree that it is uh, vital that we repair old buildings. I, I was literally in the Lincoln Annex, and he might have it. I know he didn't go to school, but he might have attended. That's how <laughs> old the building was, right? And the the mold that's growing behind, and no one can be in there. We we were at a school where you couldn't get within about 200 feet of the gymnasium because, of course, no one fixed the roof, and therefore there was mold underneath all of the floorboards. The students are are, su are they suffering, but lack of that physical activity because uh, they they're only uh, 
physical activity they get, they change in a bathroom and then they run the halls. They can't, they, they don't have access to a gymnasium. Uh, the other thing we saw, and I won't go on for, I can go on for a while, but I will not. The other thing I saw is they had a, a pipe on the outside, this large 12 inch pipe on the outside of the school where the, where the students are supposed to play. They didn't have it, any sort of barrier around it, but they, they just didn't allow any students to go outside and play because the pipe got too hot. So these, so point is that it shouldn't be that difficult between the two to agree. And the reality is if you're the administrator in a building, you're in that building. The air that you are breathing is the same as everyone else in that building, right? So um, it sh should be something that people would wanna work together to resolve. It shouldn't be that heavy of a lift. One other quick thing to go along with the training, again, going back to a, tying it into an OSHA, I'm not selling anything, just an OSHA 10 or 30 hour class. Besides the intro, which you, of course, you have to start with, but the second uh, presentation that we offer is really um, inter intro to industrial hygiene. And we label it as, we'll, we'll, we certainly use that label, but also it's just finding hazards. So hazard ID and control, uh, we talk about, of course, uh, as far as the hazards, biological and uh, chemical dust, as well as the others, the physical and safety. And why we do that is, again, so people can drill down, if you will, or find the root cause. So they, they become their own with, with that education, can investigate themselves. They do not have to use the body sprays. They do not have to have 12 candles in their room. Uh, to try to mask something that could be causing them harm, right? Not only, of course, acute harm, but down the road as far as something that's chronic, right? There's a latency period to the chemicals that we're using. So all, so let's find the problem. And, and if it's that the roof is leaking, which is about seven out of 10 times, let's fix that problem so that we don't have the, the rest of the issues that come, you know, are down down the line from that one issue that should be fixed. All right. Uh, Don, you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, a couple of things that I was reminded of. Uh, first of all, not all the fires, uh, the wildfires were in Canada. There were some in the United States as well. So I, I, I want to be pointing that out as well. I didn't call them the Canadian wildfires, the New York Times. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, the other thing is, follow-up on the union question, the first guideline on mold was uh, written in New York City in 1999. Uh, and it was prompted by the city unions. Uh, they were the ones who pushed it to make sure that that was uh, was issued and, and put out by the New York uh, Department of Health. And every mold uh, book or pamphlet or or presentation that you ever seen on that on mold, it all comes back to that particular guideline that was issued in, in New York City in 1999. So keep that in mind. And then the third thing. Uh, because I, 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 I am representing the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. I should tell people what TLVs mean, uh, threshold limit values. Um, these are put together by the, by the um, uh, Chemical Substance, Substance Subcommittee of the, uh, of the ACJH. Uh, they do it on a around the year basis now. Uh, you have two periods in which you can get uh, changes in the, or new uh, in TLVs. Threshold limit value stands for what what the humans can uh, be healthily um, stand, uh, you know, they don't necessarily want to have levels that are but above the TLD. TLD is like a threshold, basically says eight hours a day, forty hours a week. Um, that makes it, um, you know, important to keep in mind is to this is mainly a, a, a work workplace type of standard, uh, and but it is important that that is ongoing. It isn't stuck in 1972, unfortunately, where the OSHA um, PELs are. Uh, and I was there, okay? So I know that they're stuck from that period of time. Um, so keep in mind that the, the Chem subs, Subcommittee is doing that on a regular basis. And, and they have about 450 different chemicals that they are now issuing a threshold limited value. They're always increasing. And uh, one last thing on ACJH is they have a brand new book on bioaerosols, the control and evaluation. Uh, uh, code name the red book uh, I recommend that if you're going to go there to take a look at it and see uh, you know what you want to do in terms of mold uh, what what is some of the other bioaerosols including uh, for Jonathan's uh, viewpoint bioterrorism is there's a whole chapter just on that uh, so it's a, an interesting book an update from uh, from the 1999 book uh, 2024 it only took us 25 years to get an update uh, 
We'll not talk about that. Uh, basically, though, it is a, a very important text, and uh, I think uh, all of us can benefit from uh, having a book of that nature. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We have only about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 minutes left. Uh, so please identify yourself at the microphone. Sure thing. Hi, I'm Allison Savage from US EPA. Um, I had a question for the panel. I'm curious um, if panelists have experience bringing in um, people in the social sciences, like be, um, behavioral scientists or health educators to help design approaches or design messages to encourage people to change behaviors in buildings. And kind of what are your experiences? How have you built those relationships? What have you learned from them? Well, you know what? As a moderator, I'll, I'll go first answer. <laughs> give my panelists a little time to think about that. So I'm a, I'm a, I work at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and um, what it's basically a think tank at the Bloomberg School of Public Health and it's really marvelous. But what's particularly wonderful um, is that I get I have a medical anthropologist Monica Shockspana who works with us and an economist Richard Bruns. So when we're we're trying to develop policies and so on, it, it we it, sometimes they're you know informal collaborations, and other times it's you know their name is on the report and so on. So my experience um, uh, at Hopkins, it's this has been very important. So now I'll, I'll ask any panelist who wants to uh, speak. Yeah, I'd be glad to chime in. You know, at the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned working with dear colleagues at CDC, at EPA, and HUD, and the the colleagues at CDC were health communicators, and they would talk to us about things. And they're like, "Ginger, I don't think that we can say this. It's like too complicated a message." Um, we were talking about different particle sizes and where they lodge in the airways, and and they helped me make that more easy to understand. I, so they they were crucial in developing this co-branded training that uh, the three agencies did. And in addition, CDC has a built environment work group. I was president of it last year. It spans all of the different centers. So we're many different centers at the CDC. And there are behavioral scientists there. One now is in on, on the board, Joel Kimmons. And um, he's been a big advocate from the beginning of of uh, building certification programs like FitWell. C CDC helps feed in uh, technical advice for FitWell. So the, the building behavioral scientists and the health communicators are at the table with a lot of things that we do. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that we use the same vocabulary and we respect each other's subject matter expertise. Over. Thank you. All right. Any other cop? It's a within our department. We uh, we definitely use social scientists when we are trying to create messages and increase the literacy among our, our population um, for for health, for climate, for sustainability, for for equity. Um, but we also use them when we're developing kind of our, our surveys and when we're trying to learn. And we're trying to figure out the right questions to ask the population so that then we can decide what to do. I think the listening is important to us as it is, is trying to communicate back uh, what we think the right answer is at this point in time. Thank you. In short answer, yes. From the National Education Association perspective, uh, and I, I know this is true, Brian, for AFT, because we work together on a lot of things, but we often turn to our members for feedback and input because providing technical information that is needs to be used by non-experts requires engagement to not provide information that is less effective, but information that people can use effectively. And we work with our members that come from just about every possible discipline and job category. So it's a built in process to make sure that what we're doing actually bridges that gap. All right, thank you. I see we still have more questions and one I really want to get to, and this is directed at you, Don. And 
Um, what are the most critical indoor chemistries or chemicals that should be considered for immediate public health messages? And what have we learned and what should we target now? So thank, thank you for signing up for this question. Yeah, okay, no problem. Uh, the, uh, you know, there, there are so many of them, but basically the ones that I would target right now more than anything else are the two that we've been discussing in, a, in many uh, different presentations today. One is obviously volatile organic compounds. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, but there's a lot of uh, concern about it. And, and it seems to be growing in terms of the number of VOCs that are being emitted out there. So that's number one. Number two would be uh, particulates, PM uh, 2.5, and now you know looking at even PM 1.0. Uh, th these are huge problems, uh, not just in the United States, but wherever there are um, vehicles of any sort that are still using gasoline, uh, I'll think of, unfortunately, India, where I, I was uh, recently, they have major problems with particulates in the air to the point where you cannot see the sun. Uh, so there's there's a concern about that, about that and it, it's it's a worldwide concern. So I, I would say those are the two that I would focus in on. Um, but you know, there there's that, this is not just my idea. This is in terms of the US BPA. They also have said that these are uh, the top chemical indoor chemicals associated with health issues. So. I think that's that will that that two those two will be definitely ones I would focus the most attention. Thank you, Don, for that answer, and I want to thank the uh, Ginger for the the uh, giving us the opening presentation, and then thank all the panelists for this this really enlightening discussion. I could go on and on about the indoor chemistries created by cooking, cleaning, and personal hair care products where we could have occupants change behaviors, but we don't have enough time. So thank you so much.